So thanks everyone, uh, those who have joined uh, this session. Uh, the session is titled, uh, Is Software Engineering Engineering? And uh, Why Should I Care? So this talk is brought to you uh, 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 by S. Govinda Krishna. But those of uh, us who know him very well, uh, he is very often uh, goes by the name of GK. Right. So, uh, so that's how most people who know him closely call him. Uh, GK has a very vast experience uh, in the world of engineering, and uh, I hope in these few minutes I can, uh, you know, in this introduction I can justify uh, that vast experience. He uh, graduated from IIT Madras uh, in mechanical engineering back in 1985, and he started his career, uh, you know, in power plant construction with the uh, Tatas. And then he moved on to Reliance uh, in uh, refinery maintenance. So, you know, back in the 1980s, uh, uh, even uh, computers were very new to India. And, uh, you know, uh, GK was very much in the mechanical side of things. But he claims uh, he was during this period, he was bitten by the computer bug. So he bought, uh, you know, his first computer, probably Sinclair Spectrum. And then he taught himself Z80 programming. And right. from there, he moved on to create uh, a number of uh, startups, products. So to give you an example, in 1992, he conceived, uh, you know, an integrated business application. What you can, what today you would call it uh, as an ERP product. But, uh, you know, uh, probably at that time, the product was too early for the market. Uh, and, uh, you know, the time was not right for VCs and the startup scenario in India. So that came probably a decade later or 15 years later. So uh, he, he claims he ran out of funds and he decided to move on, but that did not stop him. All through the 1990s and 2000s, he has been involved in building products. He has built a lot of products, uh, you know, and he has had a very close association with Tally. He built a product called Papyrus. Another product which he has built is uh, Plasma. Then yeah, Hamza is a product which does complete mail management. GoGet is another product which does uh, effective customer management. So the beauty of all the products that he has created is that uh, his customers continue to use them three, even three years after their official support, which uh, you know is a testament to the quality of the product. That means the product is working even without active support from the vendor. So that is what it is. So broadly, if I have to summarize his past experience, uh, his experience is in product development, managing engineering teams. And surprisingly, uh, he has also you know, gone into HR. In other words, uh, more recently in his startup of Samiksha, he has been helping uh, people build uh, effective engineering teams. Now, uh, because of COVID, uh, Samiksha has taken a little bit of a hit. Uh, so in that process, uh, he has, uh, reinvented his uh, you know business activities so right now he is the cto of uh, another startup called deep cell where he is actively involved at the moment and uh, those uh, you uh, i have uh, read some of his articles that he has published on linkedin very interesting uh, read so those of you who are interested can check out that as well so with that uh, uh, introduction, uh, I think uh, we can all agree that uh, he is best placed to deliver this talk because of his background in mechanical engineering and then his uh, vast experience in software development. He has knowledge of both sides of uh, uh, engineering, rather uh, the classical engineering as well as software. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to GK uh, to talk more about himself and then uh, lead us into the talk. GK, up to you. Over to you. Thanks, thanks, Arvin. <coughs> um, so when Arvin said, "Are you interested in speaking on Engineers Day?" I felt this was a appropriate topic: um, is software engineering engineering? And really, the first question which came to my mind is, why should anybody care whether software engineering is engineering or not? Well, what does it matter? So that's that's what we will start the discussion off with. But uh, before that, um, let me just in, give, give you guys a very short introduction about myself. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So as Arvind mentioned, I did mechanical engineering in IIT Madras. I worked for eight years as a mechanical engineer with Tata Central Alliance, but I was coding since 83. Right now I'm in a startup, so I think uh, Arvind has uh, covered all this, so I'll just uh, you know, skip over this slide. And uh, let's, let's look at software development. Is it engineering, not engineering? What does it mean? So, what is software engineering has what does software development what does it mean has evolved over time okay so i'm sure many of you will have heard of this book the art of computer programming so uh, as far as um note con uh, considered it an art okay and that was of course in the early days then the pragmatic programmer refers to it as a craft that that software development is a craft and then uh, today you have courses in soft saying software engineering okay but the interesting i mean uh, one of the things with um, all this is that the way you think about it what is software engineering, etc. I'll just turn off my video so that the presentation takes up the full screen. What happens is how you think about it changes what you concentrate on. OK. For example, if uh, we look at Nuth, if you're looking at and if you have read Nuth, he will frequently use the word an elegant solution. OK, so for him, the code has to be elegant and you know. Um, when you think of something as an art, if you think something is an art. Then your mindset is more. Looking for elegant solutions and your effort will be focused on that area and there's a lot of theory that uh, goes into the psychological theory saying that the metaphor that you use if you think of business as war or if you think of business as a game or business as a team sport or business as a cooperative endeavor the language that you use the approach that you take towards business is different in the same way if you um, think of software development as an art you start looking for elegant solutions oh, the, and you spend your time. Making up uh, creating elegant solutions. And in the initial days I used to spend a lot of time. I, I remember I had a. Uh, when I was developing um, very, very early those days, I, everybody I was working in assembler and things like that. And my friend was writing some code and I'm saying, look, how can you write this code? And um, it is uh, I, I remember it was something about um, you, you could do a looping through a string. I said there, there are standard uh, uh, assembler instructions for that. Why are you not using that? Just look, it works. Just leave it right. But I, I was in those early days. I, I was um, very much, um, you know, thinking of uh, computer software development as an art. So I used to nitpick with him and I used to get very upset. But now I understand, right? It it was because I, I, I was reading these books which were looking and those were early days. Those um, in those days, everybody was worried about uh, ON or ON squared or log N and th that was what ha, that was. There was a lot of discussion on those things. Then you ca came to pragmatic programmer. They were more less concerned about elegance. They were more focused on is it robust and does it serve a purpose? If there is if you're writing software, it should serve a purpose. If, if it is not, it's, it's like a craftsman, like a craftsman builds a chair. An artist makes a painting. An artist makes a sculpture. Now, he's not worried about. Um, how useful it is. He's not worried about is it serving a purpose? He, he's looking at this. Is it elegant? Is it beautiful? So. Um, the pragmatic programmer um, when 
they came up they were very strongly pushed that software is a craft so you're a craftsman you move from being a journeyman to a master which is uh, the technically what uh, the old guild system used to make you used to join as a journeyman carpenter and then you became a master carpenter things like that or if you were uh, if you were doing this or if you were a mason you became a master mason and in fact um, in um, when i was doing construction those are designation he's master mason sir please be talk to him nicely he's he's a, he's a master mason so they have this as, as a craftsman who's making a robust and uh, something which serves a function whereas when you start thinking of it as engineering right you need to start you have to start thinking about is it well designed and architected which is less of a concern if you're a craftsman because what's the difference is what we will discuss about now what what's the difference between these three things what does it actually mean when you say something has become uh, an engineering thing right so the craftsman looks about product writing it very fast making it robust and things like that it's now engineering has changed okay so there were diff different times different priorities when the professors were doing it it was fundamental research uh, sorting search uh, searching data structures much of it was covered in no in great depth and i don't know anybody in the newer generation of programmers who knows even the basics because all that has got folded into libraries now right back then you had to write your own code but now all that is folded into um, the libraries if, if you're using python python has so many things if you you don't have to worry you do not write searching and sorting algorithms at all you're using the inbuilt library functions so in the early days when you did not have this infrastructure of library functions you had to worry at that level so you had and then you know you had to worry about o n is it o log n and things like that you don't care now then came the craftsman time when you know they were all lone stars kind of thing they they were really stars um, to give you an example peter norton he single handedly i mean if you <laughs> read uh, what he was doing he when he started norton and he started selling norton utilities which was which was an incredibly popular package in, in its day um, and he wrote a ton of best selling books if you read about him in wikipedia he was a one man show he just had three clerical staff in his company he used to write the code he used to write the book everything except you know mailing out orders and things like that he, he used to do himself right single hand right and even in india you guys must have i've been associated with tally so the earlier sorry. versions of ta tally sorry somebody had something to say i mean so the earlier versions of tally was written single handedly by bharat goenka one man he wrote the whole package it was all written in assembler in c Wac wacom c in those days so lone stars that, that that was the time and uh, you know <laughs> what i'm talking about now is a very opinionated uh, it's it's i'm sharing my opinion right and if any of you agree disagree have something to add and have a, don't agree with me please raise uh, please discuss i'm i'm very very open to having discussions as we are going through this presentation right so but now what do we have what is today's needs software is developed by teams and they are not stars they are just mundane ordinary day to day programmers they are most of them are there to earn a salary they, they want to take care of their home they, they they are not either obsessed with software development it's just a job right hopefully they are good at it but that's all it is for it and th this change means that you have to start thinking of it as engineering so if you know a little bit about history you will find 
this has been crunched into maybe 30 30 years or so maybe 40 years 30 40 years this whole thing has happened right in the 60s and 70s it started and um, we are now here uh, at a much slower pace steam generation uh, oh, before we get into that I, I must make one caveat right um, I will use the word term codes okay and and in generally in mechanical engineering civil engineering and um, architecture and all these places codes are a specific meaning it means it's a set of codified rules okay they are called codes for example you will have the earthquake code for building okay so uh, they will check the civil engineers will have to follow some laid down rules that look when if you for example the rules for building um in the north is different from the rules for building in the south because the south is not tectonically active but areas of tectonic activity like the himalayas and delhi delhi sees a lot of uh, earthquakes uh, the rules of what's the size of the foundation etc etc changes there are standards okay there are codified rules about how it should be done based on the situation right uh, it's not the same as code in uh, source code. So uh, let's look at what engineering codes are. So I, this is a picture of a power plant. Okay, and most of you are. So let's, I, I'd like to walk you through how we came to uh, things like power plant, right? So in the initial days of James Watt, right? In, that was in the 1700s and 1800s um that those were the days when um coal mines had a lot of water seeping into them and water had to be pumped out continuously okay so the earliest usage for uh, steam power was to pump out water from mines and the entire process when, when it was done was done with what is known as low pressure steam okay which was which is very inefficient high pressure steam is for uh, for the energy input the output that you can get is much higher but in the initial days people were still working out the basic tasks okay how can i convert it to rotary motion and uh, things like that so some basic tasks were being done and they were working with uh, very, very uh, simple steam, right? And then, and that was, you know, the researcher kind of environment. That, that it, it started with that as a researcher. Can I use this? How can I do this? Can, what happens uh, if I change this valve to have a separate this thing? So that, that's the initial experimental stage where you're doing fundamental research to get the engine to work well okay and then the craftsman stage came there there were at that point in time what started happening is there was a machinist i mean uh, who used who was a lathe operator and things like that of course those days you know um, they did not have sophisticated machines so much of the work was done by hand and with some few simple boring machines and things like that so a good craftsman if he built a steam engine and a boiler it worked far better than a boiler built by another craftsman right so that is why he was a master craftsman so you relied on that person actually working he would have a set of apprentices working with him and he would build the steam engine with his hand he would check it out and he'd say yes this is fine and it would get shipped and it would get installed he would probably come to make sure it starts working that that was the craftsman phase of uh, steam engines as more and more demand started coming and then you know more and more steam engines larger and larger steam engines larger and larger installations started coming more and more people started coming and 
not all the people who were building those uh, steam boilers and things like that, many of them kind of were people who walked out of the craftsman. He learned whatever he could from with some that he started his own company and he started building it. And maybe he was just not a good enough craftsman. And many of those craftsmen would hold secrets. They would not certain things they would do so that the other the uh, we, we, this is a typical problem which uh, you know in in a guild you face that only a master craftsman will be told certain things the juniors will not know so that they, they wanted to keep control over the whole thing and there were a lot of boiler explosions the boilers were which were built by people who were not very good craftsmen there were a huge number of boiler explosions and a lot of deaths. OK. And at that point in time, um, the boiler and pressure vessel code was brought out because people realized that, look, this this is no longer working as, as we cannot do, do this. So they moved into what I call engineering mode where there were a codified set of rules which was published. And anybody who built a boiler or who set up steam piping had to do it as per that code. And that code had, you know, the embedded knowledge from a lot of people. And there was an organization um, in America, it was ASME, in uh, England, it was some other, I don't remember, I think the Royal Society of Engineers or something like that. So they used to publish. And they would also inspect and you, they would also certify, right? This boiler is built as per the uh, boiler code, which dramatically brought down the number of uh, explosions and things like that. Now, if you studied the subject of engineering and you, f you had to, if you were going into boilers, you had to become a you had to become very familiar with the code. If you were doing piping, uh, you had to become very familiar with the piping code and make sure that uh, the design, the installation, uh, all those were codified. There were rules codified for all that. What is tested, what happens at the design stage, what happens at the manufacturing stage, what happens at the installation stage, all that was codified. I was a piping guy so i was very familiar with the piping and pipelines code i knew some basics of the boiler and pressure vessel code but i'd gone into pumping and uh, piping so i i was uh, more familiar and that that's how it it was as an engineer you studied mechanical engineering then you went into one field and there were some laid down codes and you had to if you were in that field you had to know that code you had to make sure that that code has been followed um, and uh, there, there would be inspection to make sure it was done. Um, I still remember in my early days what, what happened was that for you know firefighting piping, there's a specific code to be followed and there were some uh, I, I was I and my colleague were handling that area and somebody accused that we were not following the code. So a separate inspector came who then sat and measured everything that we had done and finally gave an OK, saying that, yes, it is OK. There is no problem with it, right? So that, that, that was that is engineering as opposed to um, artist or a craftsman. You, you have an engineering code and you have to do it as per that engineering code. And in that sense, you know, because there's life and death involved. And today with software, I think we are in a very similar situation. Is it life and death? Well, not life and death like that, but you now have ransomware, you have hacking of um, bank accounts and money getting siphoned out from bank accounts because of badly written software, right? And we are, in my opinion, in a similar situation, probably if you know a star craftsman 
wrote the code for the bank, um, it would be great because he he has studied that one subject very well and he, he can write it very well. But now you have a team of just ordinary guys who are, who are there for a job. I mean, Infosys, I mean, Infosys is facing a lot of flack for the income tax uh, portal. Infosys has just hired a bunch of guys and put created a project and, and they're working on the project. What code do, will they follow? Right? To make sure that this kind of thing, because the, the fact that the income tax portal is not working is damaging the entire economy of the country. Right? So we are in a state where we are create we are part of the infrastructure. Right? We are creating infrastructure as software guys, just like power plants in the olden days. I mean, it still exists when I say olden days. I mean that it evolved to that. We are not there yet because we will Infosys publish. So and um, just as an addendum, right? If a certified boiler burst, if there's an accident in a certified boiler, somebody would come inspect it, make an accident report. And if it meant that the code had to be an addendum had to be added to the code, an addendum would be added to the code saying that this causes accidents. Don't do this, right? And there would be revisions of the code. So will Infosys publish? Guys, if you are writing on infrastructure software, we wrote one. We face these problems. Don't do this. This causes a lot of pro uh, problems. We don't have this. We are not yet there, right? And mm, you know what is software engineering? It it is actually creating this infrastructure and applications, some system engineer uh, system applications and uh, business applications which are being written, and they are actually becoming infrastructure. For example. Um, so let's let's ask. Let me ask you guys a question. Okay, can you name a set of engineers, software engineering codes used successfully to clear, create a large system? Anybody have any idea of any such things? I mean, I'm throwing this, and if any of you have a suggestion, please do make it. Yeah, this is Arvin here. Right. So uh, I think in automotive and aerospace uh, where right. embedded systems are involved, they have something called Misra C. Right. So C is a vast language which, which has been very powerful, but also very risky. Some of the right. syntaxes. Right. So Misra right. C imposes some constraints on what you can use and what you should not use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, one of the things I have uh, come across. Right, and of course, right. the uh, traditional ones, like if you are doing object oriented programming, you have the solid principle. A set of five guidelines to, you know, yeah. guide developers, yeah. you know, what you should do correct. when you are designing an object oriented programming. Correct, correct. I understand. I get what you're saying. Anybody else have any other examples? So, actually, there's a Excellent example. I don't know um, how many of you realize it uh, that 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 is what happened. Why is this slide not changing? Ah, right. So one of the marvels of infrastructure which has been created is the internet. I'm able to talk to you and you guys can see my presentation. That's because of the internet. And the entire internet is based on the internet engineering task forces request for comments, right? They had thousands of requests, ASCII format for networking change, POP3 protocol, FTP, HTTP2, IMAP2. So the hundreds of thousands of protocols actually, which were published and the entire internet Internet which was created was created following this. And that is a true engineering codification that was done. I don't know how many of you have you even ever read any of the uh, RFCs. I read 
I think I've read HTTP 2 and as well as uh, POP 3 and FTP. All of those I went through. They're extremely detailed, extremely detailed. They have they have must and should and could as three different things. If it is must, it must be done. Should be done is it is preferred, but if you have some specific condition, you can avoid it. Could be done is a nice to have kind of thing. So uh, must have, could have, should have, all this. Uh, it's and all, what is when you have to use must have, when you have to have that, there's a separate uh, request for comments on that of how to use request for comments, right? So this huge set of codification came up. And that codification has actually created this internet for us. And which is which is an amazing piece of infrastructure as impressive as you know the complete electrical grid which is, which is there, this communication infrastructure. And it is robust, uh, doesn't break. Uh, it does occasionally break where, where you had the heartbeat, uh, things like that. But in general, it is, a fairly, uh, it is an incredibly robust system. This came about mainly because of the efforts of IETF and their RFCs. Uh, I think that's not something that uh, people uh, think about a lot, but yes, software engineering does exist. It existed for the creation of the internet, but Beyond that, it, it stayed in that very restricted space. Actually, if you look at a power plant, there are a huge number of codes, right? There is for running the steam, it's for piping, for pumping, for the electrical systems, for the civil systems, uh, civil systems in the sense of chimneys, right? So I, you, you see those big chimneys, right? There's a code for building those chimneys. You can't just uh, you have to follow because chimneys fall down and kill people. So there, there's a code. You have to follow the code for the chimneys. That's um, pollution control, the uh, electros electrostatic precipitators, all that has to be done. And though I accept um, Anand's uh, a statement of uh, Mishra C, right? That, that is not a, a, that is actually a good example, but solid, I don't agree because solid is not seen as look you must do this right if if i was doing some piping i could not say ah i don't want to follow the code i'll just do piping the i think this is enough i think this is enough you could not you you were not permitted to do that right today there are principles i, I am not saying there are some excellent books um of how to design well, mm, Osterhout. So many, so many people have written so many excellent uh, things on how to go about this. But what is missing in that sense is something which, hey, everybody will follow this without fail, right? The one place where software engineering happened in the IETF created amazing infrastructure. But that's the only example I know, right? So <clears throat> I think step one to make software engineering engineering is a set of codes that all software developers must be taught, know how to apply and follow on a day to day basis. They have no choice. Unless we go there, um, we are still not in engineering. We are still hoping and praying that things don't go wrong. I'm sure. A lot of prayers from Infosys now because they got hammered because of the GST portal. Now they're getting hammered for the thing. Like prayer, well, they, they can only pray. And just as you know, I was telling that um, it is a um, physical systems um, like uh, boilers, pipes, uh, electrical systems, um, chimneys, e everything. There are various sections that. We need codes for all this. How do we put down requirements? We need codes for that. How do we do architecture? We need code for that. How do we do design? We need code for that. How do we do coding? We need code for that. Yeah, I, I have, I mean, I, there'll be a wonderful design and the actual 
function which is written is messy okay it's terrible there are a lot of if uh, else if and deeply nested if all of which is messy as far as i mean it, it, it anybody who knows good <laughs> i mean a software craftsman right a software craftsman and look at that and say yuck right it may be following uh, in the design aspect it may be following solid but in the coding it's lousy then there is testing there's refactoring or refactoring is part of life for software engineers so we need codes for all this for every one of this um in samiksha we we created some sessions where we try to create codes like this okay so let me give you an example for requirement we said i, I don't want to go too deep because if we go into that that's that's a whole separate topic but for example for requirement um we said write a simple one sentence you should explain what your solution is doing yeah well and when we say that it may be one small piece of code i mean there is a function which does this what does this function do can you please write it down second when before you start coding you should know the output for normal and extreme input you should be you should have written it down this is the output i expect for this normal input and this for this extreme input this is my error condition or what is my output for this extreme input i should write it down and then start coding right that's that is what i mean then start writing the software that's what i mean by saying that we need to put down codes that you must do this you should not if you if somebody says and and i use the i i use this in you know uh, agile so i say what is your definition of done so uh, in my definition of done in some of the teams that i was working with what i said is look you have to do this you should write down what is it that in this print what you are doing what will it do what is the expected output for normal inputs and extreme inputs then um, when you are doing ui design and things like that i say look do no, you know um every for the requirements guy right do your best to toss it out unless the user will be very unhappy that that functionality is not there that is my thing you have to justify keeping this in uh keeping this functionality inside because if you say this functionality is not available you will you will be able to tell me why the user will be unhappy because this this thing is not there too often in our software we think hey this will be nice to have when we add it in and that is just simply increasing the complexity of the code without giving a benefit right the biggest problem in my personal opinion as i'm saying this is a very opinionated uh, presentation we provide functionality which is not needed hence complicating the code a lot and because of that it becomes less robust so in all this so we i have done some work on this and i don't know where to start uh, i will discuss that a little later as we go further into this what about the giants do they use codes like this mm, they have created mind boggling uh, infrastructure right industrial scale and i'm and i'm certain and slowly books are coming out articles are coming out blog posts are coming out saying what are the practices that they do there's a problem with that which we'll discuss but before that they are also releasing a lot of open source uh, what they used internally they are releasing now as open source and say yes you can use it for your application but uh, this is one of my uh, one of the issues right that there is no code on how this open source is created right and i i am right now struggling right i i have a developer who is working on view he is using something called axios and he is using something um called view this thing i don't know what is i forget the name of the library he is struggling to get the two to work together he he spent 3 days getting the two to work together that's not 
engineering. But everybody is releasing open source as and when they feel like in 0.6 versions. Even if it reaches 1.6 versions, there is breaking changes. And, and that, that's a completely hot mess, complete hot mess, right? Um, just one simple thing. I want my API to be robust, so I do not want any unauthenticated API calls, and I want this from my front end, and I'm creating a Vue.js project for it, and my developer is struggling because he says, uh, I'm using Axios because the, you're using GraphQL in the back end, so I'd use Axios, then I do, but you know, I'm using Nuxt authentication and Nuxt authentication. This version they have released, there is a problem with Axios. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, <laughs> these are, the, I, what I worry is people take this for granted. I mean, I it worries me. And this is, yeah, okay. This is part of software development, but it is the fundamental problem is because it's not it is software development. It's a craft. It's not engineering, right? So one of the what makes it even more difficult in uh, software development compared to something like a power plant is. The code which is written is written for industrial scale power plants. You do not have power plants which are meant to be used by three people. You only have industrial scale. Whereas we have these giants who are using, oh, I am sure they must have some inter and the, those things are coming out. You, you, if you Google, you can find what is the software engineering practices in Google, in Amazon, in Facebook and this thing. They're they making presentation. This, this is what we do. This is what we do, but it's not codified. This, this is just shared and it's up to you how to do it and the problem is uh, Facebook and Amazon and Google they can be following some software engineering process but my three man startup or ten five man startup can it use the same code no we can't just can't and <clears throat> you need scale so uh, you, you have a problem in scaling the code as well and which is why I'm saying uh, we need a base set of codes. Look, everybody follows this. If you reach this scale and you are facing these conditions, just, just like as, as I was saying that, for example, just let me take an um, example from my power plant, right? Right. So you have low voltage installation code and high voltage international installation code, right? So and that is a question of scale. Okay. Even for transformers, there's if if you are having larger than this current, this is the standard you'd follow. If you have smaller than this current, your stand this standards to follow. So we need codes which are fundamental. Of course, there are some things which are universal. You have to follow it. Doesn't matter what the size is. But there are certain things which are based on. What is the temperature that you're running? Which if you're running at very high temperatures and pressures, the code uh, changes. If you're running at low voltages, the code changes. So we, unless something is done towards this, I think all of us as developers will be suffering. The next aspect which um, I want to cover is rules for teamwork, right? We discussed that, you know, professors uh, are doing research, and then you had Lone Stars who single handedly wrote amazing pieces of software, very robust, very useful. Um, and they were huge successes, right? Uh, but now, and this is a problem that, um, which is why part of why uh, engineering teams. You have uh, my son is a chemical engineer. He, he decided to get out of software and he's working as in the chemical engineering design office. There are hundreds of people. Each one of them is using. He's specializing in one area and he has to study that area. He has to follow. He has to know the rules to follow there. Um, 
uh, whether you're working with dangerous chemicals, hazardous chemicals, what, that there and he has there are rules. He has to follow those codes. There's no question of it. He's just one, one member of the team, but he has to follow it. He has no choice. Similarly, I think for teamwork, there's this book which was uh, first published in 1944. It just it was actually initially um, ASME stands for American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So in 1944, a set of articles was published. This continues to be in print and it's still frequently reviewed and appreciated. It's a classic and it covers three areas. If you're an engineer and you're joining an engineering team, what do you need to know at once? Then if you are working in an engineering team and you get promoted as a team manager, what do you need to know as as what what are called as soft what we today call soft skills, right? Those that terminology was not there. But and then what are your professional and personal considerations to be considered a good engineer? What what should be what should you do? Right. And it's very easy. You just Google the unwritten laws of engineering and they are available. There were three um, uh, write ups. It, it was a series of three articles. I'm covering some of them, but not all. And we'll see that this is also very relevant to um, software development teams. OK, so. As I said, there are three sections. One is called what the beginner needs to learn at once. I actually consider, con, you know, I conduct a training session which is called Power Start, which is looking at you were you were taught in college and you were interacting with professors and you were writing code as assignments. Now you are working in an engineering office and the way you work is different, right? Some of that is based on my personal experience. Some of that is based on some of the rules that you will see now, right? And I conduct that and it's very well received. OK. So the first thing, however me menial and trivial your early assignments appear, give them your best effort, right? And this is something which I tell all the people. You cannot say I am starting up RAR. What is this? this is useless work? Yeah, this, this is just donkey work, whatever. Um, when I discuss, when I, you know, talk to them and tell them, I tell them, look, when you are building a house, right, it is not just about the architecture and the design. The plumbing has to work. The electricals, electricals, light switches have to work. Everything has to work. And when you are working, when you are part of the team which is putting up a huge building in the software, you're doing the equivalent of putting in good plumbing. And that's where you will start. You will not start be given the opportunity to work on doing a design of the frame or design of the room or design of the this thing. Think of this you, as an architecture. When I say you have to do the plumbing, I don't mean that he works as a plumber. I mean you have to design the plumbing. You have to lay out where are the pipes, how many taps will be there, where will the sink be, where will the shower be, right? So as a designer, as an engineer, you're going to be given those tasks. And if you do them well, you're boss will look at okay maybe i can give him more responsibility if you do that in a slipshod manner he is not going to give you more responsibility he's not going to give you bigger responsibility that that's uh, how i look at it right and demonstrate the ability to get things done i mean getting things done i mean, the, you know <laughs> uh, i i don't know if uh, david allen got the thing for it there, there's a whole getting things done which a lot of uh, software guys kind of love that book because it is about you take an assignment and complete it and move on to the next assignment. You do not have 13 half open assignments on your table, right? You have to get things done, package it and deliver it and say, hey, the project can move to the next stage. You have to do this, you have to be able to do it well, okay? Develop a 
let's go see attitude Th that is a very engineering phase phrase but what it means is hey something is not working that means hey i need and and this is something which uh, i mean when i interact with juniors i say look you need to improve improve your googling skills right because something is not going to work it is up to you to google correctly find the solution and implement it the the error that you are facing if you are lucky your senior may know what it is maybe he doesn't know maybe he has never faced that situation you you have to be able to say okay let me go see let me see how i can fix this right don't be timid speak up express yourself and promote your ideas um i we were having a discussion recently and what happened was we were um, we had to do some text to speech and we were looking at some software it doesn't have an api but it's getting very good so then just some junior guy said sir we are on aws amazon has poly why don't we look at it and Yeah, yeah, this this is a good idea. So, just because you're a junior doesn't mean you shouldn't express your ideas. Many of them get nervous. Don't get upset if your idea is rejected, but if you think it's the right idea, you should uh, mention it. Um, strive for conciseness and clarity in oral or written reports. I mean, good comments. relevant comments making accurate comments um all these are part of this right and <clears throat> the next thing if you don't know how to do something okay let, let's get to that later something is not working so one of the things you owe your supervisor is keep him or her informed of all significant Uh, developments so you're working on something and you are stuck it is okay and it is your duty to tell your team leader look i am stuck if you have told him i'll finish this in 3 days hmm? if at day 1 you realize you're stuck you must tell your boss that i am stuck maybe he'll be able to give you some help but at the end of 3 days if you come and tell him look i was not able to complete it i've been stuck from the last 3 days you know the question is why didn't you raise this on the first day and this is one of the biggest problems i face they're hesitant because you know they come from college where this is not how it works the professor is not going to uh, if you have a nasty professor he is not going to this thing is they have asked you finish the work and submit it that's all okay and if you don't know say so and say i am trying to find this tell him what you have done and why it is still not working just just you have to do that okay whatever you are asked by your manager to whenever you are asked by your manager to do something you are expected to do exactly that okay so many times uh, somebody has a bright idea and says i i think this will be better and they do it and later when they come and there's a review they say why well, boss this is not what i asked you to do sir i think this is a better way if you think it is a better way you first come and discuss with me i have a better way and i'll tell you to go ahead then you do the better way otherwise you do what i tell you right because you're part of a team you are you can innovate but you have to innovate and make sure that the team is not disrupted by that um, innovation right so these are these are the rules that we have okay ask other people's opinions okay uh, and recommendations listen to what they are saying uh, and that's also something which i have seen people struggling with uh, when i say that what i mean is um in college they'll say no 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 yaar you can't uh, there is an exam and there is a competitive culture right so you can't go around and uh, people may or may not cooperate with you but you, you're an organization now not only should you uh, ask 
you should if somebody asks you should respond well right these are all things that you have to do promises schedules and estimates are necessary make a promise on the basis of your best estimate and as i said if things are going wrong you should uh, update your leader as soon as possible so then he talks about okay i become you become a team lead now what do you need to do number 1 do not try to do it all yourself this, this is another problem that um i have seen in people who have recently become team leads they will assign the hardest tasks to themselves i'll do it you do this you do this trivial thing you do this trivial thing you do this trivial thing no if once you become a manager you are not allowed to do that okay otherwise you will never be able to grow second thing you must know um what goes on what what does what exactly does that mean you cannot hand off a task to somebody else in the team and say if he says everything is fine you just accept it no you you have to do a review you have to do know what exactly he has done because and that is your responsibility it is not okay to hand out tasks and say boss he should give me the task as long as the tests are passing i am not bothered what he has done that is not acceptable and i i see that much of that is because of overload i, I do not deny that right because of overload people say oh man how can i check what every one of my team member is doing but you must if you are not able to do it probably you are taking on too much work for yourself so that you are not able to spend uh, enough time on uh, seeing what is happening with the other developers and cultivate yeah and this is again you know a very crucial skill look if you are not able to explain in crisp clear terms what you want from your developer you are not going to get it it has to be you must be able to explain it in simple terms that is a skill that you must cultivate it is not something that comes automatically it is something you have to cultivate cultivate the habit of making brisk clean cut decisions that is listen to everybody's opinion then you say okay this is the way we are going to do it this is why i think this is we are going to do it this way and take that decision and move it don't leave it vague okay let's try you try something you try something don't don't leave it uh, don't uh, act like that learn project management skills apply them to activities that you manage hmm? make sure that everyone has been assigned definite positions and responsibilities uh, we Uh, i mean this is also so much okay you are working on this aspect of the project you are working on this aspect of the project don't keep switching things around and you know assign tasks at random make sure everybody knows what they're uh, supposed to do make sure there is some kind of mentor who who make sure that all activities are supervised by someone competent in the subject if not direct supervision at least have some mentor and say look this is your mentor if you have doubts in this area please go and talk to him right set up that connection and make that connection obvious so that you know the um, beginner or a less experienced team member knows and the more experienced person is also told look you have a responsibility of supporting this person never misrepresent sub subordinates performance during performance appraisal both upwards and downwards i think that is key uh, so many people you know are hesitant to say you have not done well it is important that you must be able to make a clear statement this is what was expected and you are not able to meet it that is followed by make it un questionably clear what is expected of the employees that's when you can make a good performance appraisal you should keep your subordinates properly informed just as we have a case that you know if you have taken on if you have taken on a task and expecting it to finish by third 
three days and if the first day you're stuck the team member must explain to his supervisor if the priorities have changed you must tell your subordinate look the priorities have changed i've assigned you this task please stop working on this this is the new priority and go ahead it is so frustrating for the guy that he's been working for 10 days and he finally comes up with something and says yes i've done it so oh that thing has been dropped yeah uh, just just you know leave it don't check it in do check it in but say it's obsolete and start working on this that that is not okay again and this is this comes with you know you have to know what is going on in your domain and you as a manager must accept responsibility if you you fail or your team fails it is as an engineering manager that is what is expected of you and this is the last stage which is professional and personal considerations this i think you know i i forgot to mention here uh we also need to do training when they're promoted when somebody is moving from a uh, working as developer to working as team manager you must have an orientation course for them which tells them look things have changed you cannot continue to work as a senior developer all right similarly prof this is this is some kind of continuous orientation required by hr are you getting along in an engineering team getting along with all kinds of people is crucial you cannot ignore that if somebody is seen as somebody who will not listen to people and who is always fighting and uh, things like that hr has to be told look you need to counsel this guy this is not okay in an engineering team similarly right you have a professional responsibility right so what does that mean i will tell you what that means in a engineering context huh? identify and apply requisite exp expertise right if you are doing something don't just pluck out code from um, stack overflow and put it in and just say okay it's done it's working now it is your responsibility to make sure that it is working and it is working correctly maybe you don't understand how that code in stack overflow is working right that's fine you uh, you may understand it after one more year of experience but what is important is that you have then put in a testing framework in place so that even if there is some complicated code which you have copied and pasted from somewhere in the internet you are making you have put in a test harness around it to make sure that it works right right this is this is what i mean by professional responsibility and personal liability you you are responsible for it you must take the responsible all right check it in if some problem comes somebody will handle it or i will it will come back to me no that is that, that attitude is not right right uh be ethical which i think is you know uh, today in software with ai and things like um, privacy invasions are you working in an organization which relies on privacy invasion as a professional engineer that is an ethical choice you have to make that no i won't a lot of um, th there is a lot of protests for example uh from google engineers saying that we have done some we have worked on some face recognition we don't want it to be misused by the police so they are protesting they are saying look I, uh, we wrote this code and we have certain eth ethical consideration and, and that's a huge fight that is going on inside google beware of what you commit to writing and um who will read it right basically this means mm, when you send out mail don't get emotional in it and make accusations and things like that be calm be peaceful stay cool and calm and when you are put writing an email you may shout at the guy over the table but putting it down on email don't get emotional 
think to analyze yourself and your subordinates that is key uh, i i will tell you there there was a person who used to work in my team very long back she was a she desperately wanted to be a programmer okay and the problem which we used to face and which which is something that all people in software face look this is the outcome i want okay and this is the rough expectations of what i want please go come back with a design for it and how you intend to address it that i'm i'm giving you this problem to solve that's how uh, we tend to give she will come back with 300 questions what about this what about that what what in this what happens in this condition what happens in this condition let's say look i cannot write down this detailed specs for you you have to do it then i suddenly thought and said look this attitude right it is perfect for a tester it may not be the best attitude for a programmer but it's an excellent attitude for a tester so she fought with me and fought with me but i said no i am moving you into a testing role i am sorry but i want you to move to a testing role once she moved into a testing role she became she was very happy and she started she became a star tester from a lousy programmer she became a star tester and that's that's what it is meant by an engineering managers um, this thing you have to anal analyze yourself and your subordinates what's your strength what's your subordinate strengths how can you work together in a team last maintain your employability as well as those of your subordinates which i think in this fast changing world it is something if if your subordinate says look i want to take on this assignment because i want to develop this skill you have to see how it can be done without impacting the project and that's why i'm saying that there is software engineering is engineering because many of these things are considered as must have traits in an engineering design team or an engineering team are perfectly fitting what is required in a software engineering team and i i that's why i'm saying that taking these um unwritten laws of engineering and folding it into your hr process of onboarding new members uh, onboarding new managers and continuous um, thing by the hr is critical and with that i am done i think i'm on a reasonable time we we said around 60 minutes so i'm done and now i it is open for discussion thank you gk for that uh, wonderful presentation uh, in fact uh, having uh, attended some of your earlier uh, talks i came with high expectations and uh, you have exceeded my expectations maybe tenfold so that's right. how good uh, this presentation was and it has right. something for everyone for beginners for engineering managers and also addressing uh, personal and professional aspects of being an engineer Right. so i'm sure others also have a lot of feedback and questions so let's hear it from them i myself have right. a couple of questions but uh, i'll give the chance to others first and then come back uh, later sure yeah gk this is dagendra mm -hmm. how do you connect you know yeah uh, i mean you know i see a lot of uh, uh, conflicts in terms of you know considering it is an art or a craft or engineering mm. on one side other side mm. you know yeah should be get it done by engineers or managers or business so there is again another side is you know yeah you uh, to make it engineering do you use engineers more or you know do you focus on business of numbers or you know yeah just focus on you know manager some of getting it done So somewhere right. in all these six, you know, how do you connect? You know, in, I mean, which one is more priority? Because you know, right? You know, yeah. Uh, you know, if, if numbers are more, you know, IT services actually makes it less of engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, or you know, even you know, we should not 
not even blame them but even customers are used to you know that kind of numbers rather than knowing the real value of you know outcomes right so so let's let's take one at a time right so it depends on what time type of team you have i i will tell you i have managed multiple types of teams i have managed uh, teams where there are two superstar kind of programmers right you give them any task and they will do it and they will do it very fast very well they are your craftsmen okay then you have your ordinary team members and what i believe is that as a manager you must all, which is what is said that you must analyze your subordinates and yourself you you have to know how to allocate work uh, and get work done from the team which exploits the strength of each one of them and give them the right assignments and things like that right and in the services industry i understand um, that mo- you just have a set of ordinary programmers how do you get it done and uh, unfortunately i think that is where software large projects are collapsing even smaller projects are collapsing it is because there is no code that we have to follow uh, which is what i'm saying that look when putting down the requirements say for i'm, I'm just uh, just because it's in the news i'm taking that as uh, an example right the portal is not working what what was the problem was the re- requirement wrong was the architecture wrong so um uh, in a sense there is no easy answer to it it is you have to balance this and you have to balance your business needs and what you will do and let me put it like this uh, a reputation for delivering high quality robust uh, software is a good thing to have it will allow you to charge uh, i i know it is a doggy dog world there but i'm sure infosys is going to take some hits uh, when it tries to quote further now right um because they've shown that they are not it's it's shown a lot, lack of capability and th- this this is something which unless it is taken as a serious effort and people come up with these codes see all these codes which have come up in, with other engineering teams have not come from individual organizations they they have come from a group of people coming together and saying look things have become horrible we must put down and they take the uh, look at what successful teams are doing and building i think agile was you know uh, an initiative like that uh, but was, that was more on the project management side but uh, something like agile is needed for in- the actual core development i i am not sure if i have answered your question correctly if, if you could uh, you know refine it a little further we can discuss yeah i was thinking you know yeah if you know if the world is made for engineering excellence i think it is less of management because you know many things will work straight hmm. correct some some you know because we are falling for you know it services that's where you know we expect you know managers to lead engineers right and that is where many things are failing yeah so that is true that is true but you see engineers have to get together and come up with their own standards the manager won't give you standards right It, the manager is just going to hassle you for uh, finishing things on time it is the engineers who have to get together and say look this is what we need to do right and um, and this is the conflict right because 
especially in services organization what happens is it's they're all there's nobody who has that long term focus of process improvement um and um i have tried to conduct training and i have approached some of the large organizations what they're saying is look this is this is not going to work here i have a churn churn of 40% 60% and i am you know uh, not interested in trying to get something like this what i tell them is look it is because you have a churn of 60% that you need to do something like this but it's not happening simple perfect yeah that's true you can't expect manager because when i talk to the manager he sees worried about his churn he says boss i am not going to pull out my team members and uh, take two weeks off uh, for you to teach him how to code correctly he, i i may teach him immediately move what, what what is it in for me the manager thinks like a manager right it is engineer so to get together and solve this problem right yeah maybe the final question you know do you think you know well engineered product is much faster Uh, more budget friendly than what really happens in it services that's that's a hard question right that that is that is that you know the cost curve of cost of finding a fault and fixing the fault curve which all of us see right um, but today with agile uh, I, i think it is kind of breaking down uh, definitely if you ask me well engineered code will make a difference in the total cost of total cost of the project but you see as a as a manager right if i write and and i i face this problem okay let me tell you this i mean i i, I was on the other side so people were happy right i was in a product company we had a Uh, product which we had launched and we had a call center with 20 people handling calls support calls for that product okay i took over that product it took me nearly one and a half years but the number of calls kept steadily going down until the we had outsourced the call center the call center said sir there are now only two people and you want people in shift and all that i i cannot take this on all right so but for a think of him as a services organization right if he wrote the software and he was supporting the software does he want to invest time and money up front in writing excellent software and after that he will just place two support people to support his customer or does he it says hey boss do it as quickly as possible it doesn't matter if there are bugs it just means that i have 20 support engineers supporting my product what makes sense to him right so I, and this is the problem uh, they the manager looks at his upfront costs and he is saying i don't care if the product is not well engineered yaar it just means that i have a larger revenue stream doing product i'm sorry but this is reality no, but uh, see maybe that product will fail right because now the way we are cursing you know uh, maybe uh, it, in this case because it is government and compulsory income tax right maybe used but right. in the approach what you said you know yeah see the product is suffering and then you know it is actually the customers are feeling it and after some time they may drop using it they may stop using it that is the entire opportunity is lost no th- and that is true and that, that is very very true if you are talking about things like saas products uh, if you are thinking about subscription based services and things like that what you are saying is correct when a company invests a few million dollars in developing a software system they are not going to drop it because the board will screw them what the hell do you mean you invested millions of dollars in creating this software and now you're saying it's not okay and you're going to drop it a uh, support center goes into operational expenses it's okay yaar i just put it into operational expenses this is reality right uh, which is why 
subscription based services what you're uh, are saying is very 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 relevant because subscription based services there's a boss we'll drop this subscription and take a subscription from your competitor right but when it is a project doesn't matter whether it's the government doesn't matter if it's a large organization in the large organization whoever placed that whoever placed that order and the you know the service providers provided a substandard product has got to fight for it because it is his neck is on the line right this this is this is what actually happens sure thank you so much right any yeah. other questions from other participants uh, yes i have a question sir right uh, your name just state your name uh, my name is aman okay uh, carry on sir you talked about industrial codes uh, let's say a valve in a boiler should work uh, within a certain pressure limit so that kind of becomes code for designer of that boiler right, right. so and then you mentioned you're concerned about the lack of certain codes for programming so uh, my question is whether trying to better programming practices will lead to some similar format to tackle each task or is is there a possibility of many solutions that are equally well engineered and follow best practices so uh, if later is true then uh, so i am wondering whether it, is it even possible to come up with certain code for programming and best practices um. Uh, a good question. So let me put it like this. I am not saying that all programs which are written without having codes are badly engineered. There are well engineered products which even though there is no code. OK. But. If it is. If it has to become part of an industry practice. So let me just say it. it um, there's one way to look at it as look, I want my team to write good software. If, if that is um, what you're looking at, that is fine. Uh, you can do um, well engineered, well architected software for yourself. You can do well designed software. There's nothing wrong with that. But as an industry, if, if you are looking at it from an industry perspective, if you want to see Look, the fact that Infosys is getting a bad name worries me because it is a hit on the software industry. I'm part of this industry and I don't want my industry to get a bad name. If that is the viewpoint you're taking, right? Then you have to create codes. And I agree with you. Is it possible to have one code when there is such a wide variety of uh, things to do? Uh, as I discussed with you, right? Even in, when, when you have codes, you have scaled codes in the sense, look, if it's a low pressure boiler, this is all you need to do. If it's a high pressure boiler, you need to do all this. If it is a superheated boiler, you need to do all this. Similarly, if it is uh, low voltage, this is fine. If it is high voltage, you need to do all this ex additional precautions, things like that, right? So, and there are some codes which are common. Th this must be done. If you're building a boiler, whether it's low pressure, high pressure, uh, superheated, doesn't matter. You have to do all this. Whereas there is additional things if you you have to do if it's a high pressure boiler. There's additional if you have to do if it is a superheated boiler. Just like that, you have to have some basic codes. If you're coding, you must do this. You must follow this code. And as you scale up and as there are variations and if, if you look at it like that right so if you look at a pressure uh, power plant there is a boiler there is a turbine there is piping there is um, electrical substations there are multiple components in a power plant similar to how we have in our org in our software we have front end we have middleware we have back end well so many uh, we have infrastructure we have so many aspects to that project right so which is why if you see in my I'll just pull up my presentation again for a minute. And. Uh, take you back to this slide. 
you need a code for requirement separately architecture separately design separately coding separately testing separately refactoring separately in architecture you may have okay if you are handling financial transactions uh, say for example financial transactions is one area where you have codes right there is something called pci if you are using um, uh, credit card if you are accepting credit card you have to be pci compliant otherwise nobody will accept your website right so there are bits and pieces of this code of the fact that there should be a code which is to be followed all over if it is ietf if you are building a ftp server you have to follow ietf standards you can't not follow ietf standards we need more and more such codes it is not that there will be one universal code there will be a code for back end design there will be a code for front end design there will be a code for middleware design there will be a code for infrastructure design right so the, there is a multiplicity of codes that is required the, it is not going to be one code does it answer your question yes sir uh, as i am perceiving the answer it looks like uh, we should follow a certain tailoring according to requirement hmm. and uh, sir i have one follow up question like uh, as a programmer what should we aspire to be our end goal like should we aspire to be a craftsman in your uh, terminology or should we aspire to be a lone you know lone wolf doing right. <laughs> yeah. so the lone wolf is a, the lone wolf is a craftsman right and as a personal goal for a programmer as a personal goal for a programmer it is always to be a craftsman to be a superstar in your area of technology right as a personal goal for a programmer that is what it is but for an organization the goal is different i i want systems which will work even though i don't have superstars in my team i just have ordinary people in my team but i still deliver safe functional software so that is the question that you are asking is as a programmer as a programmer you must read this book right um, the pragmatic programmer you must read it you have to understand it and you must know solid code you must know uh, all the other aspects you have to make yourself a soap, so, superstar but that is not the organization's goal that is your individual goal can understand sir thank you for the suggestion and answers yeah anybody else have any questions I have a question. This is Arvind here. Right, Arvind. So uh, we have some standards like a capability maturity model, IOC, ISO quality standards. Right, right. So I believe all these standards. I mean, they have been applied to, of course, software engineering. And uh, my view is that uh, correct me if I'm wrong. My view is these were created more uh, by managers from a management mm. perspective, project management perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they focus on the process rather than you know uh, looking at the internals of how the code is written and stuff like that what is your yeah. opinion because you are in your talk you emphasize these are problems which need to be solved by engineers engineers correct. have to come up with these codes correct so these standards I, that i quoted probably they are uh, you know uh, written by managers right uh, absolutely absolutely see arvind that that those are quality standards to follow please understand they are they are positioned also as quality standards right they are processes which they say if you follow this process uh you will ensure quality right but the problem with those processes is that you can follow the process and still have a lousy product <laughs> right hmm? the because they are quality processes they are looking at are you writing this down have you written it they are not worried about 
what you have written it is it written correctly right have you fulfilled this requirement and those are totally diverse from engineering codes because uh, this iso process even an engineering organization goes through that right and that is a completely separate aspect independent of following codes the the iso in engineering team will say that you must ensure that everything is designed as per the boiler code you must ensure that everything the process uh, guys the quality process people will have checks to say whatever checks are mandated by the boiler manufacturing code your shop floor should implement your design team should implement everything mentioned as design consideration in the boiler code but the process the people who are doing software i mean this uh, quality processes they are not saying what is contained in the boiler code the, yes they yes. rely they rely on engineering codes and they put processes on top of it the the problem is people thought hey this is a quality process let's enforce the quality process but quality process always fail unless you have codes which which all the process will ensure is that you are doing as per you can put up a, a lousy design process i say this is my standard process and i am following this process and the quality team will say fine this, you said this should be your process and you are following the process fine nothing you pass <laughs> that that's the problem yeah yeah any questions from anyone yeah thanks for that wonderful talk uh, uh, it was very enlightening uh, to connect uh, you know traditional engineering with uh, software and i found it very interesting uh, about, to learn about the evolution of how we looked at software from right. art from craft uh, from art to craft and then craft to engineering so that was also a very interesting uh, perspective uh, so if no questions from others uh, i think we can uh, take leave here right uh, recording of this session will be available on youtube shortly probably by today or tomorrow morning right so thanks uh, a lot to gk for this uh, presentation thanks everybody thanks for listening to me patiently thanks arvin for giving me this opportunity it was very nice thank you very much thank you everyone good night good night thank you